come on in. I've been making Stilton soup, and it made me think about cheese in general. Uh, I found a Stilton at the back of the fridge in a very nice presentation jar, which I was clearly meant to give someone for Christmas, and never did. Uh, it was well past its sell-by date, but it was cheese. It's meant to be off, and it was delicious. I knew it would be fine because of an event that happened at the White House in 1835. Now, I don't often take advice from that particular place where my health is concerned, but this story is fine. I remembered it from a collection of books about American presidents, which I've had since I was a kid. So, there was once a dairy farmer called Colonel Thomas Meacham. He lived in a place called Sandy Creek in New York, a town so proud of him that there is actually a plaque telling his story on the roadside as you cross into the place. Colonel Tom made fine cheese, and he decided he wanted to make a giant wheel of the stuff as a gift for the current president, Andrew Jackson. 150 cows were called into service, an immense cheese hoop and press were created, and a single round cheese weighing 1,400 pounds with an 11-foot circumference was created. It was held together with a belt emblazoned with a bust of Jackson and emblems of the then 24 states. It was sent off by boat and reached Washington in time for it to be paraded to the White House in a cart drawn by 24 horses to celebrate George Washington's birthday. No one quite knew what to do with it, so they did what we all do with an unexpected parcel. They left it in the front hall of the White House. Two years later, it was still there. And someone, possibly Jackson himself, thought he couldn't stand the smell any longer, so it was decided to give the cheese away. Now, it was too big uh, for one person, so the general public were invited to a free cheese fest. Apparently, 10,000 visitors turned up, knives in hand, and ate the lot in under two hours. The cheese was gone, but the smell lingered, and one of the first things the next president had to do was have the place whitewashed and repainted. Now, the American journalist Benjamin Pearly Poor wrote about it, saying, for hours did a crowd of men, women and boys hack at the cheese, many taking large hunks of it away with them. When they commenced, the cheese weighed 1,400 pounds and only a small piece was saved for the president's use. The air was redolent with cheese, the carpet was slippery with cheese and nothing else was talked about at Washington that day. Even the scandal about the wife of the president's secretary of war was forgotten in the tumultuous jubilation of that great occasion. Anyway, two years in the White House front hall and everyone still enjoyed it. I'm pretty sure an extra couple of weeks for a Stilton in my fridge is fine. Uh, the scandal, by the way, was the infamous petticoat affair concerning John Eaton being made Secretary of War, even though Eaton had married a woman who supposedly had many affairs with married men. In the end, Eaton had to resign over it, and today... Oh yeah, today nobody cares. There we go. Uh, cheese leads me to goats and my book of days. Robert Chambers today writes about a travelled goat. He says, On the 28th of April, 1772, there died at Mile End a goat that had twice circumnavigated the globe, first in the discovery ship Dolphin under Captain Wallace, and secondly in the renowned endeavour under Captain Cook. The Lords of the Admiralty had, just previous to her death, signed a warrant admitting her to the privileges of an in-pensioner of Greenwich Hospital, a boon she did not live to enjoy. Well, this is both a tale of intrepid bovid adventure and a tragic story of a fine creature not getting its just desserts. Uh, the goat had belonged to the botanist Sir Joseph Banks and been on board HMS Dolphin while it circumnavigated the world for the second time. You'd think going round once was enough for anybody, but Banks set off again to do the same thing two years later with Captain Cook aboard HMS Bark Endeavour. The goat, whose name is sadly unrecorded, was there to provide milk. They all got home in 1771 and the exhausted goat died a year later. If you search about this goat, there's a lot written about it. Um, for about 25 years in the 18th century, there was a British newspaper called The Craftsman, it was owned by Lord Bolingbroke, and like so many publications owned by rich men, pretty much consisted of the view of Lord Bolingbroke. Uh, but they did publish an obituary to the goat. You don't get a lot of goats in the news these days, although I am embarrassed to confess I have wasted 10 seconds of my life watching one sing the chorus of a Taylor Swift song on YouTube. I digress. Anyway, the real question is, did anyone make cheese while the goat was providing milk? The writer and philosopher G.K. Chesterton once mused, poets 
have been mysteriously silent on the subject of cheese. It's true, it ought to be corrected. I mean, people want to sound cultured, right? My wife is groaning. Uh, human beings have been making and consuming cheese for about 10,000 years, pretty much since sheep were domesticated. Store your milk in the leak-proof stomach or other organ of some ruminant, and you may not know that rennet, the enzyme used to make cheese, is naturally present. Leave your precious bladder of milk in the sun and boom, you will have invented cheese. The word itself uh, means to ferment or become sour, and as early as the Romans they were making a veritable cheese board of choices. Rich people had even had a separate room just for making and storing cheese. Uh, today that's called the delicatessen down the road. The Romans trooped across Europe carrying cheese and met people on the way who no doubt declared, wait a minute, I've got a wine that would go with that. And so this splendid foodstuff made its way across the world. Even the Bible mentions cheese. It's one of the things David brings to his people just before he knocks out Goliath. For centuries, it was women who made cheese. It was an indoor job and the boys were presumably busy outside with heavy lifting. Today we celebrate cheese royalty, for it was today in 1761 that Marie Harel was born. Marie Harel, remember that name, for she is the woman who invented camembert. Or maybe she didn't. See, here's where facts are hard to come by. What we do know is that she was born in Normandy in France. I mean, I'm not sure this story would work as well if she weren't. She may or may not have lived in the town of Camembert, which is small, and at the time didn't have the cheese museum it boasts of today. She may or may not have worked as a cheesemaker at the manor of Beaumoncel, where there may or may not have been a priest called Abbot Charles Jean Bonvoust, who may or may not have been a sort of cheese whisperer telling Marie how to make her cheese. It seems so typical that we take a woman in history and decide she can't possibly have done something so amazing. What we do know for sure about Marie is that she made the best camembert ever, and she created the systems to enable it to be mass-produced. It was her who enlisted the help of Eugène Ridel, who invented the thin wooden box made for the delicate cheese to fit into, and thus enable it to be safely transported from the lush fields of Normandy to my table. I was going to try and write a cheese poem to her. Chambers concludes his words on the travelled goat, declaring, on her neck she had for some time worn a silver collar on which was engraved the following distich. That's a marvellous old word for a couplet. A distich composed by none other than Dr. Johnson. Perpetuae ambita his terra premia lactis hac habit altrici capra secunda jovis. Uh, lazily, instead of working this out, I inputted the Latin into Google Translate, which returned... An inquiry and bitter, this the reward for the milk. In this it has the second a goat, Empress Adelaide Thursday. Which makes no sense at all. But I'm thinking of trying to pass it off as very avant-garde poetry. Avant-goat poetry. Maybe if I rework it a little with the word cheese in it. Any suggestions, welcome. Take care. Be kind.